So what am I doing here? First of all, is our, our mind shift. To come from banking up here where everything is very structured, to come down here to then try to address the needs of the people. And now we're going to talk about interest rates, okay? So the story that I have for you is this week. We went to visit, you know, because my French location is here, I can't speak too much detail, so I'm trying to understand what I'm saying, but we went to visit um, distributors. So we finance distributors because those distributors have the last mile connectivity into kiosk, into a bar, into a salon, and so on, right? They're the ones who know who that customer is. So why is it important? Because it helps us to develop our credit score, the algorithm that Dan has talked about, right? So we go down, and uh, we don't know what our price point is going to be. We don't know what's tenor. We're going to, 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 to make this is it seven days, is it one day, is it a 30 day? We don't know. So we went to investigate. And as we were discussing there with uh, one of the retailers, we asked him, so what are your margins kind of thing? He tells us his margins and asked him, so hypothetically speaking, we charged you 15% per transaction alone. He could borrow five times in a month, he could borrow 10 times in a month, right? Mm -hmm. If we charge you 15% flat, does it make sense to you? He did his calculations for the product that he sells or the products that he sells. His margin is 40%. Okay. Because on the ground there is not paying taxes, eh? No, these guys are not anywhere near. <laughs> and that's the thing that you need to first, you need to understand that. It's a, it's a very serious thing where we sit here thinking that we know what is going on in the economy. We don't know. And I'm telling you that because of humility that I've had to eat humble pie. After 24 years, what is going on down there? It's crazy. So, the guy is making a 40% margin per week. Alright? He will take my money at 10, 15%. You understand? So now we're talking about price point. What is expensive and what is not? It is relative. It is relative to the user at the bottom, right? And we always think that the people who are borrowing at the bottom of the pyramid or who are looking for credit rightly put because they don't have the access to credit, right? That they don't know what they're doing, isn't it? That suddenly somebody will borrow a thousand shillings and then it will become three thousand. And oh, we've got it to three thousand six hundred percent. Yes, there are those there are those kind of apps that are charging one percent per day and when you compound it. You know, really, they shouldn't be doing that. But what have you heard here from that? 70% of his loans, in turn, away he's open to all consumer, are going to work in capital. That first should tell you something, right? The second thing we found when we went to the ground, so I'm sure if you go to uh, Google Play Store, and you open Play Store, and you go and type mobile lending apps in Kenya, the usual suspects, you find Right. And the top, the and, the top, <laughs> yeah. and, yeah. and so on, isn't it? Tunisia yeah. is inching its way up, right? Those are like four or five, isn't it? Yes. They are like 95 more. They are like more than 100 lending apps in this country. Yeah? People are washing money. How many? 1,700. Just 1,700. I think I scrolled and said, oh, die. But the point is, what does that tell us? It is a runaway success of M-Pesa as a platform. Right? You've got so many millions of users on that platform who are looking for access to funding or to insurance or to whatever it is, right? And so we'll have talents and branches who will look at the opportunity because the opportunity does exist, right? I wish I had a hundred million dollars. I certainly would put it into something like that because you will make your money back. And the third thing that we found is that the people are very honest on the ground, eh? extremely honest. We have problems here. These are, these are the challenges. <laughs> Think about it. The NPLs are less than ten percent. I don't know what makes people say 30, 40, 50. They're less than ten percent. That's the truth on the ground, right? So people, okay, most loans are like a 30-day loan, so you have past years, you get to 60, you get to 90, sometimes even to 130 days, no doubt about that. But people invariably pay. And so the average is about 10%. So what does that tell you? You've got 1,700 apps. You go down to the ground, you tell a guy, I've come to give you some mobile credit. He won't even talk to you. He thinks you've come to rob him. You know, because they don't trust us up here, isn't it? He thinks you've come to rob him with your funny ideas and umakuja kuchukua. You must explain to him where I am. What's the product? I'm talking about in my field, right? Because we, we only uh, finance working capital, directly to working capital, and like, let's say like, uh, like right. uh, brands, right? Mm -hmm. Who are open to consumer. But you can see the convergence, even though we're still in working capital, still 70% of his book is doing exactly the same thing. So what I'm trying to say is that, briefly, that those rates are very relative, that what Dan has said is very true, that invariably the algorithm tends to reward, because remember we go out giving an unsecured loan to somebody who you don't know other than digitally, You've got a little bit of data. That gives us a little bit of comfort to take the first step out. Yeah. To say that even though I don't see you physically, I can give you a little bit of money to push you on your business. 
And as his business grows, bring the rate down because he's a loyal customer. So, that's how it works. So, the, the, yeah, uh, yeah, I want to give him a big hand. <laughs> What we are saying is that if we had a good infrastructure of identification and validating the identity, they wouldn't go for very high rates. Rates to start with. Um, John, I know you have a lot to say. Uh, this is quickly turning into a banking debate, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm now focusing on it because what he has said is there is quite an opportunity out there. What? In all these years, 50 years, we've only revolutionized um, this space in the last five, ten. What is happening and why aren't you covering and penetrating the way they've been able to? Because you could easily have done that with the infrastructure that you already had. You know, there's, a, there's an old saying that the, um, the person who discovered the fridge or the refrigerator is not the person who was selling ice. Nice one. Say that again. The person who discovered the refrigerator is not the one who was selling ice. Okay. So kill his business, right? Yes. Isn't it? So to expect banks to kill themselves, it's not possible. However, just as banks resisted and passed, but today banks embrace it more than anyone else. I see the same. I mean, you talked about 1,700 apps. That's what I have. Which today, a lot of them are bank apps. Isn't it? Quite a few yes. are yes. bank apps today. Yeah. So, so the banks are there. <laughs> the banks are there. Now, we haven't done as well as the non-regulated um, apps. And the reason for that is actually very simple. That everything we do, as banks, is highly regulated. The amount of approvals we have to get, Fred, Fred knows this very well, the amount of approvals we have to get, when you have an idea and you're working at it, today in Kenya, for a mobile app from a bank, it's taking a year and a half to get to the point of approval. Wow, okay. a year and a half. A year, year and a half. So by the time you get there, <coughs> someone branch, when they think about it, the money. They're out there. Yeah? So I think there is, um, the, the reason I talk about convergence is because I think eventually what banks will do is bank groups like ours, NIC group, will want to go out and perhaps partner with someone like Branch because I've got the deposits, but to get to the point where I can get approval to do what they are doing will take me too long, yeah? And with a lot of restrictions because all my charges have to be approved and today they will look at me as a bank and say, wait a minute, you're still a bank. So that 15% that uh, my friend Fred is charging per month, I'll be told even that per year is too much. We have 13% your bank. And then it makes it unviable for us. And that is what's going on today. Okay. So I think over time there'll be convergence. I guess that was my point. Yes. But the convergence is going to come from banks and independent, unregulated money lenders coming together. Uh, did you hear that? The build of the fridge was not the one selling us, which means that they were sitting on these solutions all along, and they, you know, they could not afford, but let's not even go there. Professor, there are people who are borrowing to pay loans that they borrowed previously. Um, this is a good solution, and it's obviously filling a gap, but are we enslaving some of our population to make them the, the cash is readily available? that they got caught up in that whole mess that they, today they borrow and they need to pay tomorrow, so they borrow from Fred to pay Dan and so on. It's education. When I, when I was a student in the US, I used to do that. I used to get four credit cards, and I get money from this, I pay this, because they need this, I pay this. And then the summer comes, and I work so hard to pay, you know? That, that is education. education. <laughs> 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 that's education the hard way. Yes. You have to pay the lamb and the lamb to. The way you teach a child not to cut fire is to live. The fire burning and you let yes, the right Yes, next time they will do it again. Okay, I want to believe that Dan has a different solution, like self regulating and making sure that there's some 
there's a code of conduct, some principles that all of you as lenders would have to abide by, by, you know, self-regulating so that it, it, things don't run. We're, we're, we're building a solution uh, through the blockchain thing. Okay, so you're the yeah. ICE person. Yes, we could, we could, you could actually know this guy has borrowed from 10 other people. Okay. And, uh, and tell him we are sorry. Uh -huh. Right now, there is no visibility. Yeah. There is no visibility. Yeah. But because of the infrastructure we're building for the government, you would actually see this person has borrowed beyond what they can be able to repay. Okay. Dan, uh, your thoughts on that? Um, so two things. Uh, I think financial literacy is something that has to be done, and not just by the fintechs, because this is something we've not done very well as a country. And uh, at, at branch, we, we take it very seriously, because we have so much data, and so one of the things we've been trying to do is to educate customers. And we do it very well. Uh, we can be able to look at the life cycle of the customer and know when to target them with specific um, information and education. And the second thing I wanted to add on uh, Fred is that one thing we realized with our customers is they like this benefit. They don't want to lose it. And that's why when you look at our NPLs, they're better than tier one. Because people value this benefit. And that's why they want to pay their loans. Uh, yeah, and you see yeah, there's going to be a few instances where people will call it. But we see excellent performance in terms of our loan book. This is a benefit people don't want to lose. The shame of people having to give out their funds to be able to get a thousand shillings is something people don't want to go back to. And so um, it's, people like it. And I hope that you know, we can combine that with uh, data, not so much data, and consumer education to revolutionize this product. It's only you know, four or five years old, uh, so we can continue you know, building on the foundation that we've laid. Okay. I just wanted to add one thing to that. So, when you're talking about the non performing loans, uh, you know, perception wise, and let's say it's about 10%. But if you make it back in where John is now, it's really about 10 to 12%, isn't it? 12.7%. 12.7, right? So Round it off 13. Yeah. So, all I'm looking at is uh, not that it's higher here or there, but you're finding similarities. This is the digital side, it's about 10%. This is the non digital formal side, it's about 10%. So, there are correlations. Why is it 13? <laughs> John, are you in trouble as a as the banking sector? Um, it, from I didn't think that when I got into this room, but it looks like you're being swallowed by branch and FNS and whatever professor is building and selling ice. Are you in trouble? Yes, banks banks are in trouble. I mean, let's let's be frank as. You know, I, I, I always like to tell the story of the famous uh, iPod, which I guess we've now, now, now we just use our phones. But the iPod, I mean, why it started, and, and even Amazon, the same story, was they walked around and they saw all these huge tower records and universal records, huge buildings that were stacked with CDs and, you know, CDs and CDs and CDs, and you went there and, you know, Spend your whole day trying to find that one CD that you're looking for, right? And they said, wow, that's expensive real estate. Could we do something else with it? That was the reason. Oh, it was a real estate. Yeah, how much space you occupy. Yeah. Could we do something else with it? Amazon did the same thing. They went around to these massive bookstores. And they said, this must be really expensive. Now, I'm sure Fred, when you walk around, the branch here when they walk around, they see my branches. The same thing goes room with them. It's <laughs> expensive real estate. Exactly. So we're in trouble. We're absolutely in trouble. But I think, in the long term, and I go back to my convergence theory, that we do also a lot of surveys ourselves. Before we open a branch, I mean, Professor talked about the fact that we are always open to branch. Before we do, we do a survey of our customers. Interesting enough, what we have found is that Customers will not open. Yeah? It will change over time. But today, a customer will not open an account with a bank unless they know where the branch is and they always prefer the closest branch. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. mine is very is once they open the account and they never show up at the branch. Yeah. Before they open it, they need to say your branch is this place and is the closest to where I work. How many have used mobile lending? <laughs> to borrow. <laughs> to borrow money. Yes. To borrow. Mostly to borrow money because I, I won't ask who has used 10 pesos seriously. I, I was the last and even I have used 10 pesos. So um, who has borrowed money on mobile platforms? I tell you about questions. Okay. So, so, so Dan, please take, take your 10%. 10% eh? <laughs> of these people haven't paid you. <laughs> and who wants to tell me what's the experience? I'll, I'll go with you. What has your experience been? Yeah, um, quickly, come here, come forward. Yeah. I'm sure you have questions for the panel. Prepare those. What has your experience been? All right, thank you very much. My name is uh, John, John Ritara. And uh, I don't know whether I'll be supporting the uh, mobile lending or I'm supporting mobile uh, because I'm in the restaurant business or the bar business. And uh, one of the biggest problems that Report has had is uh, restocking, right? You have a function coming up on Saturday and you don't have money. Uh, a distributor doesn't uh, want to give you credit. They don't want to take your check, but uh, it's going to be good on Monday. So what they end up doing is uh, asking you to pay cash. Uh, and then here comes Mobilon and uh, you know, uh, they say that you can give you credit for two weeks. That's all I needed for my business. Uh, and uh, they breached that uh, aspect of, uh, cash. of, of cash flow. <laughs> uh, and then it's really helpful. Well. <laughs> so, branch is good actually, but my concern is the amount of access and data you require from someone when installing the app. You need access to the camera, access to basically everything. And I'm like, uh, why do you need that much data? And I'm borrowing like 7K, right? And uh, you also need someone to log in with Facebook. And we all know Facebook is fake it till you make it. So I have returned to be in Dubai, and you use that to evaluate my credit for this. I'm just thinking, is that really the right way to do it? Or do you rather like do more background data search on someone? Uh, before you go, uh, other than uh, issues that oh. have nothing to do with money, was the money aspect of it, was it? No, it should actually be good, because you borrow and you get it like in about five to 10 minutes, which is really good. Okay, and the interest rate was agreeable. Eh, no. not really. Okay, you don't really have much option in a fix, and you need money, let's say 15 to 20%, what do you do? You take it, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. All right. Actually, tell you that's who will give you for 
1% or 2%. If they know you well, uh, 0.5%, um, you can get much, much lower. And that's what I need to see to push them lower. So if you are just stuck with the, five, the first four, they will skin you alive for a long time. So let's get these new ones that are coming with the new options. Yeah, okay, so, so we have, the second question is, um, so we have to learn to use, you, you're only using Facebook as a login uh, uh, option. That is, has, a, has been done already. I mean, you have the option, but now you can sign up with uh, SMS. Oh, so you don't need to go through my Facebook? Is no, 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 okay. no. And the camera? For ID verification. Uh, I'm not sure that you have some ID verification. ID verification? We do, we, we've we integrated with IPRS. Okay. So you can actually be able to ping the database and confirm that the person is actually applying for the loan is the yeah. new yeah. owner of that account. Okay, um, who has a question? Uh, here. <coughs> yeah, come up here. Um, thank you. So as a lawyer, I, I don't really understand money. <laughs> but I, and I hear what John says about banking, the regulation around banking, and I think I understand why that's important, you know, that, that we, as societies, uh, our loans are underwritten, money's there, we're not going to run out of money. And then I think about global credit crunch, uh, and these buzzwords like subprime. Uh, and I, I kind of, I may be completely talking off of my head here, but I kind of worry that microfinance and accessibility of loans through newfangled ways of saying, uh, assessing people's uh, credit uh, reliability, and you talk about people's history of paying, but you haven't talked about people's willingness to pay. And what happens if there's a change in the economy, for goodness sake? What happens if the Kenyan shilling is devalued, if there's a drought, if there's failures of crops, if the economy nosedives, and all of a sudden your 10% becomes 90%, fueled by people thinking, well, actually, if I don't pay, what I have got the money, what happens? And then we start to wish, oh, wouldn't it be good if we still had the granary full of cash, and if we still had the regulation making banking work in a, in a conservative fashion? I don't quite know which side is right there, but I worry about it. John, you're gonna take that, and uh, he's worried that um, we might be a little too quick to discount the views of banks, and they are still a very relevant uh, institution. Yeah. So, so again, um, as I said, the primary responsibility of a bank is to ensure a depositors' money safe. So, I think that that will always be the case, uh, and should be, uh, and I think. You know, the professor has talked about, you know, this, uh, what is it called? Bitcoins. Bitcoin was one of them. I will see it. I feel. I feel. I feel. And, um, and we have seen what has happened to Bitcoin. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, because we follow it. Because, yeah. you know. Um, do I think that mobile lending will create a bubble? I guess that's the question, Rupert. Is it going to create a bubble? Absolutely, yes. I have no doubt. I mean, the reason when Professor talks about the four credit cards, I think most of us have played that game somewhere in our lives. Four credit cards. That's what a bubble is. A bubble is when you have spent more money than you can pay, so you have to borrow from Peter to pay Paul, and you keep doing that back and forth. Eventually, Peter dies, and you still owe Paul. <laughs> That's how the bubble happens. So I think I think we have to be careful. But I think how you resolve that is what Dan said, is actually consumer education. We have to continue, continually make sure that financial education is also being taken to those people that branch is able to reach. Okay? It's being taken to those people that we use, we borrow from, you said we borrow yen at 2%? From Japan. Boga, we borrow 2% from, yeah, from Japan. Those people must be well educated. Yes. To know at least that when you borrow, this is the responsibility that comes with it. In developed world, like in America, they call it predatory lending, where you're trying to pump lending to these people that are not well They're educated. Not yeah. And in fact, most of the regulation on financial lending in developed markets is aimed at protecting that vulnerable consumer, not the bankable people in this room, because it's assumed you bankable people read the terms and conditions, understand financial responsibility. But that mama boga, that consumer, who is on pay day loans, who is on those, you know, 
weekend loans. You can eat somebody who is at a bar drinking until 4 a.m. They need to pay their bar bill. They get on, uh, on brunch. Those are the ones that need to be educated and also need to be protected. Uh, they are drunk. How are they going to get Can I add one more comment? Yes. Um, so, I think there's also a bit of a misconception about the fintechs. Um, people think that everybody who shows up at Brands goes with money. Yes. Uh, I think that's very untrue. We do uh, quite, um, we do a lot of assessment, and one of the things we look for is uh, evidence of over uh, indebtedness or even evidence of um, CRB rating. So we've trained our model to be able to look for those kind of information. So we don't just lend to anybody who just shows up. Because I think that's what people in the public think that everybody who goes, you know, comes to brands, you go with money. It's not actually true. We do a lot of um, assessment. And part of this is also because we are signatory to responsible uh, uh, lending. I think it's only one of the you know, one of the 50 global fintechs that are signatory to these guiding principles. There are like 10 touch points uh, that we are required to adhere. Okay. Um. Fred, uh, you want to say something, and then I have a question. Oh, I have a few questions. Okay. I just wanted to add to what Danny is saying. First of all. It's important to note that over 90% of all mobile loans in the market are not in actuary or teller or branch in the banks. 90% of mobile loans are in banks, obviously, because of the big animal in the room, actuary, and then you take the others, right? KCBN and so on and so forth. But uh, again, you know, I, I asked a question, I didn't get an answer. Why are the NPLs in the formal sector, this one where people are educated? Because now you're talking about Mama Boga, you say Mama Boga doesn't know left from right. <laughs> she doesn't know whether she's in charge 10 or 50, isn't it? Yeah. How come the NPLs are 10%? And in formal sector, they're 12. Um, John, Why? Yeah, I'll end. <laughs> John, to Jonathan, I'll just say that uh, the big animals, the banks, um, we know what happened to Chase and Imperial. Uh, nothing like that has happened to Mama Boga. <laughs> uh, well, the your NF, uh, your NPLs, no, I know, but still, uh, aggregated, we've had a bit more failures in your sector than... Um, I think I have a brother who wants to help me with this. <laughs> oh, okay. come here. Yeah, my name is Onchera Baiko. Um, here to protect my brother. I first met him in New York, so maybe that's why I'm here. Actually, honestly, this has been an amazing discussion. I wasn't sure what to expect, but I've learned a lot. Uh, what I was trying to point to was the first one which he talked about, and he's already talked about it. When I met John, I was involved in quantitative investment, building mathematical models to invest. You know what the critics, the recovering critics said? Investing quantitatively is a game where you collect pennies and then eventually you ask for a million dollars. So eventually, and that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but let's be clear what's going to happen. Cyclically, you're going to eventually have a crisis. A crisis doesn't mean you shouldn't develop, but let's be clear you will have a crisis. It's going to happen. I'm just saying what you're saying in a different thing. So that was a passing thing because you already started talking about that. For me, the real thing is the danger of the single story. Yeah, the danger of the single story. So the issue isn't, I think John said that, I didn't expect to support John in any form of fashion when I came here. But that's what I found, the danger of the single story. It isn't that, what is it called, that uh, microfinance is challenging banking and those are the two solutions. I remember sitting at a, at, a, at a talk that everybody should have been at. There was a global expert called John Key, who was actually brought to Kenya by the financial sector deeply. And he tried to tell a story that is the real story in my view of what will develop the country. Microfinance is a great thing. It's not going to develop the country. Let's look at the history of how did Europe become Europe. Okay, forget the story that some new, brand new things will change it. He pointed at some cows and showed in Switzerland that most of the history of the financial markets, and that's what didn't happen here for colonial reasons, came out of people who were trying to protect themselves. So the solution which combines this risk management is that the savings must come from the community. 
So inside those communities, people must think. So it might not be NIC, so I can criticize NIC, but from a different direction, and it's not John's personal fault, I was a banker myself. It's simply that the banks as they were built developed a certain way, so we're still gonna have to go, I agree with John, the banking route, while criticizing them. It isn't, that's what I'm calling the danger of the single story. When I say that, it doesn't mean I support them, I highly criticize them. But I'm not sure that microfinance by itself, and then I'm not saying microfinance must be stopped. That's what I'm calling the danger of the single story. You still need to go to the communities, and that's the message he left us that I think he talked and we clapped. The government of the central bank was there, I reminded him about that last week, and we marched on to continue with what we're doing. He said, if you want to develop your financial sectors, you've got to realize you've got to build a finance that is not about what me and John are doing on Wall Street, but about the community, putting money together, etc. And that might not come from microfinance, that is, we should stop microfinance. So I think we should also realize as we debate that it isn't one or the other, that there might be some third, fourth reason why our financial sector is not.